Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We'll have an opening statement from Coach Simmons on the upcoming game at Grambling State and then open the questions. Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> uh, good morning, everyone. Hope our, everyone's having a beautiful day. Um, just a quick recap of last week's game. Uh, you know, again, I thought the guys uh, you know, really, really fought and really showed a lot of character and resilience. Um, you know, we had a lot of adversity um, <clears throat> in the form of some calls not going our way. Um, had some injuries there early on and um, you know, had two uh, you know, critical turnovers there that led, <clears throat> that led to points to get, you know, South Carolina State back in the game there late. But uh, I thought our defense showed tremendous poise and resilience and faith um, to, to really stand up and, and, and hold those guys in that last drive and preserve a big win for our program on the road against a really good football team. And uh, so, again, excited to be, you know, four, sitting there at four and two and um, riding a four-game winning streak. A lot of momentum, and uh, we'll need to continue to work and, and build on that momentum as we head into Louisiana this week to take on the Gremlin State Tigers. And they're a team that um, obviously their record doesn't uh, show the, the – I think the quality of the team they have. And um, obviously this is their first home game, much like last week's game was uh, South Carolina State's first home game. So there will be a lot of energy there, a lot of excitement. Um, it's always tough to play in Grambling. Um, you know, they are the one program that can match or exceed our, our, our history and tradition. And so just being able to go there and have two um, giants on the football field, as far as our you know, legacies and, and history, um, is, is something I'm excited to be a part of. So um, need a great week of preparation and uh, get our guys ready to to take uh, another tough road trip and got, got, to be able, got to show that we can win on the road. And uh, we did that last week, and we'll need uh, an even better performance this weekend to, to come away uh, with another big win for our program as, as we get to the midway point of the season and continue to um, make our push towards postseason play. Coach, on Saturday, um, well, let's just talk about throughout the season. Throughout the season, it's been games where y'all run away with it uh, in the second half. This time, you know, y'all had probably the best first half performance that y'all had all season. Just tell me about um, the just how you could just put it all together and, and get a complete game on your belt. Well, obviously, that's the challenge every week uh, is to, to put it together for 60 minutes. And so, you know, it, it takes um, a lot to make that happen. You know, one, it starts with – being in, in, in great physical and mental shape. Um, I think physically we're fine. I, I don't see us physically wearing down in games. Um, we don't have a lot of guys going out because of cramping and don't have a lot of guys bending over, hands on their hips. So I think we're in pretty good running shape. I think for us, the challenge is to build a little bit more mental conditioning, mental toughness, to, to be able to respond when something bad happens. You know, we, we kind of have a habit of, of, of let things snowball, so to speak. Uh, we'll have one bad play, and that bad play will be followed by another, uh, and then another, and then we find ourselves in a critical situation. The other day, we had two back-to-back -back false start penalties. Uh, I don't think I've seen that in quite some time. Uh, but again, it's just, you know, we got to be able to bounce back from those low points, because that's what football is, and that's what life is, right? And I tell people all the time, I don't believe in bad days. Uh, I think you have bad moments throughout the course of a day. But when you look at the fact that you woke up in the morning, that you had a chance to close your eyes that night and wake up again the next morning, that's a great day, right? Because a lot of people don't get that opportunity. And so throughout that day, we'll have some moments. And I think successful people have a way of bouncing back from those tough moments and getting back to functioning at a level that allows them to have success. And as a football team, we have to find that same thing. We have to be able to take a bad play, whether it's a penalty, whether it's an explosive play, giving up on defense, a sack, a turnover on offense, a big return on and special teams giving up, whatever the case is, put it put it behind us, learn from it, and get back to playing good football, then I think you'll see us put together 60 minutes of, of, of solid football. And right now we're doing it in spurts, um, just not doing it consistently enough to have that dominating performance that we feel like we're capable of having. Coach, is a lot of that just – just? I mean, you mentioned the offensive line specifically. Is a lot of that just youth and experience kind of trying to get this team to still gel together? Uh, I think youth has something to do with it. Um, but there are some older guys on the offensive line. You know, Jalen Goss is a graduate. Uh, hadn't played a lot of football, obviously, coming over from Florida State. 
Um, has not played a lot of football, so this is, I think, his sixth career start. Um, so still learning in that regard. Uh, Cameron Colvin's been a two-year starter for us, you know. So, again, he's a, he's a veteran of the group. Brian Crawford's played a lot of snaps. Uh, T.J. Lee started a few games for us last year. So we do have three guys up there who played a lot of snaps, relatively speaking. Um, but we do have two guys who have, haven't played any college snaps, and T.J. Demas and Charles Davis. And so there's a mixture of, of, of class within the offensive line group. Um, but again, it's just a matter of those guys really just deciding what type of offensive line they want to be. Um, I was talking to a coach, uh, you know, one of my coaching buddies this morning, and we were kind of sharing the same thing. Um, I think it's a mindset, it's a mentality. Like you have to convince yourself that you're going to be a, a dominant, physically imposing offensive line group, right? That, you, that you're willing to strain your body, that you're willing to finish plays and, and not just be satisfied with getting on my guy. Like, okay, I got to block this guy. I got up on him, so I get a plus on the play. I don't get graded down. Well, but that guy shares my block and he makes a tackle six yards downfield. I shouldn't be satisfied. Like, we have a saying here, it's ball me, man. My job is to keep my body between the ball, which is the ball carrier, and the man, which is the defender trying to tackle him. So as long as I keep my body in that position, we win. Too often, we start in that position, but we don't finish there, right? We allow our guy to slip off of us and make a tackle. So just building that mentality that we're going to be the team that finishes one of our else. we got to finish blocks better. Um, and, and, yeah, we got to get to where we have a turn that we do our 111, which means I have to do my one part of the whole part of 11. 11 players on the field, I have one part of that responsibility. I have to do that one part. Too many times it's somebody not doing their 111. So it's not the center every time that's getting beat. One play may be the center who got out work. Then the next play, it may be the right guard. Then the next play, maybe the left tackle. So just trying to find that consistency to where we stack plays together where all five linemen are doing it consistently, you know, drive after drive after drive. And that's when I think we had the success that we need offensively. So Coach Henry's challenging those guys. Um, you know, maybe we're looking at some potential uh, moving around of, of positions, you know, and not positions, but personnel to, to, to create some, some more competition, right? That they're not complacent. That, okay, I'm, I'm the starter. I'm the starting right tackle, and I'm the veteran of the group. And, you know, and I'm not – I'm just using that as an example, but we got to create some competition to, to let those guys know that the guys that work the hardest, that, that care the most, will be the ones that play the most, and, and that's what we have to find. And if we do that, uh, I definitely feel like we have, have a chance to be a really, really prolific offense. Coach, good morning. Can you talk a little bit about – being the guy that's here extending, as you alluded to, the legacy of Robinson and Gator when it comes to this game and how important it is? Well, I mean, you, you're absolutely right. To put that in perspective, um, obviously this past spring, we had the first ever Legacy Bowl, which is an all-star game specifically for HBCU football players. And so Doug Williams and Shaq Harris, two you know, prominent quarterbacks who both played at Grambling, um, started the game and it, it kind of centers around the Black College Football Hall of Fame. Um, so when they started selecting names for the teams, well, one team is called Team Robinson after Eddie Robinson. The other team is Team Gaither after Jake Gaither. You know, so these are the two pioneers. These are the two giants um, in, in Black College football. Like if they, they, there's a Mount Rushmore of coaches, you know, who, who coached Black College football um, you really can build a, a statue, a, a monument of two guys, and that's Eddie Robinson and Jake Gaither. Now, there are some other guys, you know, uh, Coach Merritt, Tennessee State, Coach Mumford, you, mm -hmm. know, um, you know, Coach Hayes, and, 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 and even now recently, uh, Coach Broadway, you know, some of the guys that have really gone on to do great things. But when you think about black college football in, in, in its entirety, it's, it's two giants. It's Eddie Robinson and it's Jake Gaither. And so to, to be on the field um, in this game that for a long time determined the, the Black College National Championship, you're talking about the two teams that have the most Black College National Championships, you know, with FAMU and Grambling State. Um, it, it's a special feeling to be able to, to play in this game. So we're excited about the opportunity. Um, we hope that throughout this week, a lot is spoken about that legacy, about that tradition, about, you know, Eddie Robinson and, and Jake Gaither and what they meant to their respective programs, these respective communities, and, and the game of college football as a whole, because they are two again, uh, of the pioneers, um, particularly during the time of segregation and what they were able to do, uh, it, again, I don't think will ever be, uh, you know, repeated again. So 
uh, definitely honored to be able to, to, to coach in a game like this and against a guy that's as well respected as Hugh Jackson over at Grambling State. Coach, um, I know I asked you about this uh, after the game. I've just seen if maybe y'all had a had um a status update on on Isaiah Land's injury from Saturday. Well, he, he didn't practice yesterday. Um, you know, he's walking around with the um with a, a, a small brace, not not a big brace. Um, I think we're still awaiting the results from the MRI. So hopefully we'll know more today. Um, we're hoping for best case scenario, obviously. Uh, maybe a bone bruise, you know, something where it's just a pain tolerance deal that um, there's nothing structurally wrong. Uh, he took a pretty nasty cut block there and, you know, Cleet didn't get stuck in the ground, th uh, thankfully. Um, feet came right up from underneath him, um, but he did get blocked below the knee. And, uh, and I know that's a block that has really been talked about a lot within college football. Um, I think this may be the last year of seeing that that particular block occur. Um, because now that's that's probably the only block that's left that's not at the first level. That's not an offensive lineman cutting a defensive lineman. Uh, that tight end coming back across the formation and cutting the defensive end is the last block left in college football. Again, that's not at the line of scrimmage. So I think this may be the last year or two of that rule uh, because, again, you don't want to see injuries like this. You know, Isaiah Land's our best player. He's probably the best player in, in black college football, one of the best players in the nation, and, and you hate to see him, you know, go down with, Something like that, but it's football. You know, it wasn't it wasn't an illegal block. Um, it was perfectly within the rules. But I think for that very reason is why um, the NFL, college football, are really starting to take a hard look at, at those type of plays. But uh, we'll we'll get more information as the week progresses. Hopefully today, and uh, if he can go, he's going to go. We all know that he's a tough kid. Um, you know, so if he's got to brace it up and go, he's going to go. As long as there's nothing structurally wrong, and he doesn't run the risk of, of hurting it further, uh, he'll go. And so. Hopefully we hopefully we can have them. Um, you definitely would love to have your best player with you. Um, but again, we'll find out more uh, hopefully here with them but by the end of the day. Coach, can you just talk about Coach Jackson on the other sideline and um, the challenges that Graham will present to you guys? Well, you know, he's a coach with, with all the experience, right? I mean, how, how many times you get to coach against a guy who's been an NFL head coach? And, um, you know, major college power five offensive coordinator. And so he definitely has a pedigree. Um, he has experience. And so anytime you're in the first year, you're trying to figure things out, right? I mean, he took over a program that, you know, had early success under Coach Fobbs' tenure there. Um, I think they went three years without losing a conference game back when I was at Prairie View. So they were the class of, of uh, you know, the SWAC during those days. And then, uh, you know, over time, they had some struggles there. And then this past year, they made a switch. And so with Hugh coming in, you know, change the culture, try to change the culture. Uh, defensively, they went totally away from what they've done for years, which is a heavy pressure team. You know, three down, uh, a lot of five-man pressures, a lot of, you know, single safety uh, defenses, cover, cover one man, and then some cover three zones. Um, hired, hired a coordinator who had more of a quarters background, a four-down background. So, I think now they're starting to kind of maybe figure out what they want to be on offense as well as defense. And so uh, they're playing much better ball now than they played at the beginning of the season. And I think they're getting some guys back from injury. So again, they're a dangerous football team. You definitely can't take for granted a team, one who has the, the history and tradition of a Grambling State University, right? That, that pride is there. Uh, much like when we got here in, in 2018, the first thing that, that I was charged to do was a charge of doing was make these guys understand what they're part of. Like when you wear this route, if you wear this route the head, like it means something. Like there's a certain level of pride and, and, and passion that has to come along with it. Right. And, and so I, I think right now they're trying to find that even so much. So that if you notice the last few games, they, they play without their, their logo on their helmets. And so I think that's a statement to the team of what they expect from them. And I think he's told them they'll get the G's back when they show that they've earned it by playing the way that they're capable of playing. So, you know, obviously when you have a team that has that type of mindset, a coaching staff that has that type of mindset, you got to be ready for a dog fight, right? And so our guys definitely can't relax. We've been playing really good football lately, primarily on defense. Uh, so we have to keep that up. You know, we got to continue to stop the run. Um, they have one of the more dynamic running backs in the in, in the conference, Maurice Washington, a Nebraska transfer. You know, he, he showed against Jackson State a few weeks ago 
how dynamic he is. You know, I think took an 87-yard touchdown back against them. So they got some dynamic playmakers out wide. Um, got some young quarterbacks who are starting to get into their groove. They played three. And uh, so, again, we just got to make sure that they don't figure it, figure it out against us. Keep them in question mode. And then defend. Uh, for us offensively, it's about establishing the run and protecting the ball. You know, two things that we didn't do very well on uh, this past week, which found it was, you know, found us in a dog fight. So if we can do that, establish the run and, uh, and and protect the ball like we had the previous weeks, then I think we give ourselves a great chance to go up there and and have the type of game we're capable of having. But by, by no means can we assume that this team, because of their record, uh, is going to lay down and just let us come up there and walk away with a victory. Coach, you mentioned the, the run game right there. That's what I wanted to ask you about. How important is it to getting your guys' run game back to where it needs to be, not only to establish a run game, but to take a little bit of pressure off of Jeremy too? I mean, sometimes I feel like he forces some passes because he's you guys are relying so much on him throwing the ball. How, how important is it to get that run game back established? It, it's imperative, and it's something that we've you know, talked about consistently over the last couple of weeks. Um, I want to have a balanced offense, right? I want to be known as a, as a, as a team that can run the ball as, as efficiently as we can throw the ball. Now, the numbers may be skewed. We may find ourselves throwing it more than we run it, but we want the efficiency to be there. And right now it's not there um, in the run game, right? And so, again, we got to challenge our offensive linemen to communicate better, to strain blocks better and finish. Uh, our running backs have to do a better job of being patient and pressing the line of scrimmage, setting up the blocks by the offensive line and utilizing those blocks. Too many times we're running and we're not setting up blocks the way we need to. So a guy that's, that is engaged can shed the block and make the tackle and we're not pressing the line or pressing that block enough to where we keep that guy in the place and we cut off of him. We got to do a better job of fighting on the perimeter. When we break to the second level and third level, too many, guys, too many times the defender, the DB is coming off the receiver and making the tackle. And so again, it's that mindset of ball me man. I got to have more of a mentality to keep my body between the ball carrier and the defender than the ball than the defender has of getting to the ball carrier. And that's something that we're just not straining enough, right? We got to do a better job of straining. The plays are there. Um, and now we got to obviously put ourselves in some advantageous situations with personnel and formations to maybe create some extra gaps or, or, or you know, create some opportunities to maybe get them all blocked, you know, as opposed to RPO on the guy or push cracking the guy. Um, but we got to commit ourselves to doing those little things. And if we can do that, uh, we got the backs, I think, that are more than capable. Terrell Jennings, Jay McLeod, A.J. Davis, and even DeAndre Francis. Uh, we just got to get in the rhythm. And we have not been able to get in the rhythm running the ball. And just like you said, that's going to take a lot of pressure off Jeremy because we don't want to get to a situation where we're having to heavily rely on him just throwing the ball every down. You know, he's more than capable of making the throws but, you know, when teams know you're going to throw it, they're pinning their ears back and they're coming to get you. We got to be able to slow them down with some play action passes with our screen game. But the most important thing is being able to establish a run game that forces the defense to have to make decisions when the ball is snapped and, and, and guess, not guess, but react to what you're doing as opposed to now it's like, okay, well, we know they're throwing it. Let's just go get them. So it's imperative that we establish some type of ground game and hopefully we can get that done this weekend. Coach, as y'all, surpass the halfway point of the season. What are you telling your team to, you know, just just to convey that message that, you know, it's time to finish strong with five regular season games left? Well, we're conference from here on out. Um, so, again, we, we, we still have a mindset of playoff football, and whether that's the SWAT championship, you know, if Jackson State stumbles twice, or that's the FCS playoffs, uh, if Jackson doesn't stumble twice, we got to be in position to do that. Right. The worst thing that can happen is if Jackson does stumble twice and we drop one. Well, now we're back out of it again. And now we're on the outside looking in, you know, or Jackson wins out and we drop one. And now we're sitting there with three losses out of, you know, during the regular season. And maybe we don't get into the FCS playoffs. And so we still have a ton to play for. Right. We're only one game back. And so, you know, we got to continue to stay hungry. We got to continue to work to get better uh, because, again, that nugget is still hanging. And as long as it's hanging, we need to be trying to, to go get it, right? And so it's not that psychological talk of, well, we're five games back or we're one and four or two and whatever. Uh, we're sitting in a pretty good position. We just got to finish it, right? And that's been the message for the guys. I think they've received that message. And now we just got to commit ourselves to working hard every day to be able to get what we deserve, right? And if that's being a playoff team or that's going to the SWAT championship, then, then that's going to happen. But we have to work to deserve it because it's not just going to be given to us.
and coach about that Isaiah Landry. Was it was it a knee or was it the ankle or it's it's a knee. Um took it like I said, took a cut block um right there at the knee and um knee kind of a quick tweak. Um so again, don't it it doesn't look on film to where it's something that's structurally, you know, going on. Um, hopefully it's just a bone bruise, right? He did take a shot that that kneecap, the helmet went right there on the side of the kneecap. And, um, you know, it was one of those cut blocks where, you know, they kind of topped over and landed on his shoulder pass. And so uh, it was a pretty, pretty, you know, it was a pretty nasty legal cut block. I want to make sure that that's known that it was perfectly legal based on the rules that's in place today. That block is perfectly legal. The, 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 we call them the sniffer, the yo, fullbacks, tight ends um, was within the tackle box. Right. So with the, if you're within the tackle box, you can cut in any direction. Right. And you just got to be what they call 10 and two. And so if you're facing the defender, he can see the block coming. You're allowed to block below the waist and, and, and all those elements were in place. And so it was a perfectly legal block. We had talked about it all week. Our guys knew that those blocks were coming from them. Um, he tried to protect himself, but, you know, he did, the guy did get there and hit, hit his helmet right on that kneecap. So, again, could be a bone bruise. Um, could be something a little bit more uh, severe, but uh, again, we'll know more and hopefully we can get them back by this weekend. And uh, cause we, we definitely would love to have our best player. Uh, we have a bye week a week after. So we feel good that he'll have a full week to recover uh, before homecoming. But, you know, again, we'll know more once we able to get results from the, from the MRI. Any other questions? All right. Well, that's it. I appreciate it as always. And uh, we all traveling. See you guys this weekend. Safe travels. If you guys that are not, don't know if the game's televised or not. But if not, I'll uh, definitely see you guys next week. Go Rattlers. Thank you, Coach. Thanks, Coach. I don't have no photo. I don't have no way.